Kavala, Session 8 What is the great secret of Kavala? As I have attempted to demonstrate thus far in this series, Hakabala is robed in a manifold lattice of mysteries. There is disagreement over everything about it, from the number of ten or eleven emanations, to the arrangement of the twenty-two paths, and the structure of the tree of life itself. To this extent, Hakabala raises more questions than it answers, and seems to pose more problems than it solves. However, because the number of relative attribute traits is finite, and thus the myriad of shapes they may be presented upon is finite also, there must be a single, right combination of them all, regardless of whether or not anyone ever agrees upon it being considered such. Thus, the great secret of Hakabalah is which arrangement of attribute traits onto which shape is the right and correct one out of all those possible. As for my own contributions, I have long favored the gras shape for the tree of life and have studied various arrangements of the standard 32 mystical paths of wisdom upon this. It has long been understood there are 231 possible combinations of 22 total attribute traits. As such, this amount is called, in Sefer Yetzirah, the 231 Gates of Binah. The sum, 231, is arrived at by taking the integer 22 and squaring it for a total of 484, this being the total of all possible arrangements if all 22 variables could repeat. Next, one arrives at the Gauss sum for 22, adding 22 plus 21 plus 20 plus 19, etc., all the way down to 2 plus 1, which equals 253, this being the sum of all possible combinations if none of the variables repeat. Finally, we subtract 253 from 484 to arrive at 231, the final sum of all possible combinations subtracting all combinations without any repeating variables. The equation expressing this formula is n squared minus parenthesis n over 2 times 1 plus n close parenthesis. This means that out of 231 possibilities only one possibility is absolutely right, and regardless of anyone ever finding it, there is no proper way to tell which one is definitely correct. This is the reason there are different orders for the alphabet. The best manner of expressing the attributes the letters count is shuffling them like cards. Randomized thus, there is clearly no single, absolutely right, linear order. Therefore, I propose this model for the 22 paths on the Gra model for the Tree of Life, labeled by the 22 trumps of a tarot card deck. If it is the single, absolutely right, and definitely correct model or not, may be impossible to ever ultimately determine. However, if it is inaccurate, it is only one of the 230 wrong options possible, and thus means little to nothing as such. I should also add, the basis for this arrangement is not mystical. It does not stem solely from the attributes of the tarot trumps, nor blossom forth roseate hues and tones of color correspondences based on the artistic expressions of these. 
It derives from using the same methodology of applying labels to lines that has been used to construct Hakabalah since time immemorial. Just as each line or path of the tree of life of Hakabalah corresponds thus to a tarot trump, each one of the 22 tarot trumps can be corresponded to one of 22 names, and thus the same place on the Gra diagram may be occupied by a tarot trump title and or a name. As we can see here, the names of the 12 Anunnaki, the Titans or rebel angels who judge from the underworld, and the 7 Igigi, the terrestrial born, Olympian demigods or Nephilim may be placed onto this diagram as the twelve diagonal and seven vertical lines or paths. However, arriving at this arrangement out of the 231 possible is no simple straight line between a blank canvas and the placement of each trait where it is on the diagram. After all, there is a good reason that the moon, tarot trump cards, placement, and the location of the Anunnaki, moon, deity, Kingyu, are not the same. It is for the same reason the moon, tarot trump, does not, in most modern tarot card decks, correspond to the Hebrew letter Beth, which in turn corresponds in classical Kabbalah to the moon, among the seven Olympian dignities, or planets of antiquity. Each new order for the 22 attribute traits marks a new age in which the same traits are given new names and placed, literally, in a different order. Thus, what were the Sumero-Babylonian pantheon became the Hebrew demons of hell, and so the trumps of the Tarot were designed many millennia later to symbolize the same archetypal attribute traits as the Sumerians had called their gods. Comparing one to the other is, as I have already endeavored to accentuate, relatively arbitrary and any validity impossible to determine. However, what must also be remembered is that the first and simplest attribute traits are the 22 letters, and all the rest of the possible attribute traits fall secondarily and so forth after the placement of these. The 22 letters are the Phoenician alphabet, translated into their equivalents in modern Hebrew letters. Thus, each of the 22 Hebrew letters corresponds to a number, given here is the Roman numeral of the tarot trump, to mark its place in order on a list, as well as to an attribute trait from ancient astrology, these being the twelve houses or constellations of the ecliptic zodiac, the seven planets of antiquity, and the three alchemical phases of matter expressed as salt, mercury, and sulfur. So the placement of the tarot trumps is secondary behind the placement of the earlier Sumerian deities, which is based, in turn, on the placement of the correspondent Hebrew letters, and each of these is given a gematria number and astrophysical sign as well. Each of the 22 original Hebrew letters was also said to have a magical image and these are listed as correspondent to the letters along with the number where they occur in a list and each one's relative astrophysical sign. When cross-referenced with the 36-letter alphabet of Egyptian hieroglyphic monoliterals or single sound letter symbols, it may be found these 22 magical images each corresponds to a certain one of the Egyptian hieroglyphic images as well. 
Thus, even though the phonetic sound expressed by the Egyptian hieroglyphic and the phonetic sound expressed by the Phoenician Hebrew letter may not be the same sound, there is a correspondence between the letter given from Hebrew and the hieroglyphic given from Egyptian. Thus, all these attribute traits may be summed up as relating to one another in a variety of different ways. And, then, these arrangements of relationships between them all may be depicted as lines or paths along the Tree of Life diagram as a metaphor. At this point, we may find the traditional manner of depicting these attribute traits upon this visual form less logically satisfactory than simply making a single list of them all in the order they should be seen to occur. Just as there is a single correct and right placement for each attribute trait on the Tree of Life diagram, there must be one such list. In a list, the placement of the attribute traits relative to one another on the Tree of Life shape is less obvious. However, it is also possible, in this format, to provide a much larger sum of possible attribute traits to be assigned. Here we may see a chart that lists, thus, the 22 lines or paths on Hakabalah's Tree of Life as 22 rows, and expresses the various different names and titles associated with these that have arisen in different places and eras across the globe as a series of 16 columns of different possible lists for these correspondent attribute traits. The 16 columns may be seen as divided into eight simple columns on the left and eight complex columns on the right. The eight columns on the left are labeled thus from left to right along the top. The first is R hashtag or royal number associated to the next column's titles being those from the tarot trumps. Following this, the third column is labeled APZ, or Alchemy, Planet, Zodiac, Signs. The fourth column gives the so-called magical image, or symbol, associated with the earliest Phoenician letters, and the fifth column gives the Egyptian hieroglyphic correspondent to these. The sixth column gives the gematria sum of each correspondent Hebrew letter from the order they occur in the usual modern Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew letters corresponding to these gematria sums, etc., appear next in the seventh column, and finally in the eighth column on the left side appear the Greek letters as seven vowels and twelve consonant pairs. Again, take note that the phonetic sounds associated with these Greek letters do not equate necessarily to those made by the correspondent Hebrew letters, nor to those made by the Egyptian hieroglyphics. These represent different phases of development of these same basic systems that took place in different geographical regions at different ages of historical time. The symbol and hieroglyphics being the oldest from around 8,000 years ago, followed by the Hebrew letters and their gematria sums from around 6,000 years ago, followed by the Greek from around 4,000 years ago, by the tarot trumps and their royal count from some 2,000 years ago, and finally to the shorthand notation of symbols we use to express the astrophysical signs today. In the columns to the right, we find a more complex grouping of attribute traits. These begin on the right with the twelve Zibalba gods and seven houses of the Mayan Popol Vu, and, proceeding leftward, we progress backwards across the eons of recorded historical time, 
next to the twelve apostles and seven churches of early Christianity. In the third column in from the right, we find listed seven Sethites, over twelve tribes, and these are the seven pre-deluge patriarchs from Seth, son of Adam, to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, and the twelve tribes of Israel, named for the twelve sons of Jacob. To the left of these we find the fourth column, labeled seven Nephilim over twelve generations, these being the seven generations born to the lineage of Cain prior to the deluge that supposedly destroyed them all, and the twelve generations being those from Noah to Abram, whom changed his name to Abraham on behest of his Elohim, the Lord God. To the left of this list, in the fifth column back, we find twelve archons over seven powers, listed in the Gnostic era hypostasis as having ruled before mankind became a species of our own, and including Cain and Abel, the firstborn sons of Adam and Eve. Next, we find the twelve Sumerian Anunnaki, and their seven Igigi, demigod counterparts in the sixth column. The twenty-one fallen angels, listed in the apocryphal Book of Enoch in the seventh, and in the eighth and final column, we find the seven archangels of the days of the week and the seven Camia. Now, the seven Camia appear listed such that each planet they symbolize is represented twice, except for the sun and moon. Thus, five Camia appear twice, and those of the sun and moon appear only once each. The entire chart, if each of the complex columns is measured as an aeon of 2,000 years apiece, can extend from the year 2000 A.D. back to 18,000 years ago. Of course, the expression of the greatest sum of attribute traits can best be accomplished only using the format of cards. Each card acts like a door or gateway leading to a path or line on the Tree of Life map of Hakabalah. The 22 trump cards of Tarot thus may be used as a platform onto which may be assigned a border of attribute traits around a central attribute trait to total an odd number of attribute traits per each card. In this arrangement, we see ten of the Tarot trumps above, five cards over five, and twelve below. 6 over 6. Each depicts centrally an Egyptian hieroglyphic, and each has a border around its edge assigning 8 attribute traits to it. From below each central hieroglyphic, around this bordering edge counterclockwise, we begin with the symbol, or magical image, depicted by each hieroglyph and proceed next to the signs from astrology or alchemy that we find in the lower right corner of each card. From there we move upward along the right side edge to come to the Mayan deities and house names given from the Popol Vuh. In the upper right corner we find the Hebrew letter associated with each attribute trait the topmost center label gives us the title of the Toro Trump associated with each. In the upper left corner we find the Gematria sum associated with the Hebrew letter from the modern order of the Hebrew alphabet. Along the left edge we have the names of the Sumerian deities, the twelve Anunnaki, associated by the Sumerians with planets and subsequently with the twelve 
houses of the astrological zodiac round and the seven Igigi or Enlilites, associated by the Sumerians with terrestrial half-breed gods, and subsequently with the Olympians, attributed to the then-known planets of classical antiquity. In the lower left corner is given the Greek vowel or consonant pair that is affiliated thus. It should be noted here that there are three cards without correspondent deities from the Mayan or Sumerian pantheons, and these appear on the top row on the left and rightmost ends and in the middle. These cards correspond to the Hebrew mother letters Aleph, Mem, and Shin. In my own Jacob's Ladder arrangement, it is possible to map not only the 32 mystical paths of wisdom given on the standard Tree of Life diagram, but also the seven hells and twelve curses on the Tree of Death diagram as well. When the dual tetrahedron of the Tree of Death and the dual cube of the Tree of Life are combined into the Jacob's Ladder arrangement, as we see here. A total of 72 traits may be obtained by doubling the traits assigned to the ten emanations, subtending a pentagram of five traits, and crowning the model with the triangle, labeled by six traits more. The labels of these traits seen here, however, are not the same as those on the usual Jacob's Ladder arrangement. Instead, each attribute trait is labeled by a pair of either a letter and a number, or a number and a symbol, one for each of the four terrestrial elements, fire, earth, air, and water. The letter T, in this context, stands for Tarot Trump Card, and the letter Q for Queen, A for Ace, J for Jack, and K for King. Such is the Tree of Life component of this model of the Jacob's Ladder diagram explained. Now, the Tree of Death, the subtended pentagram, and the supernal triangle are all labeled according to a chart that lists the four elements as columns and ten attribute traits apiece as rows. Thus, in total, 40 attribute traits are given as number symbol pairs and 32 as letter number pairs. Just as with attribute traits assigned to the Tree of Life, the assignation of these attribute traits to the Jacob's Ladder arrangement here is likewise ultimately arbitrary but finite and therefore there is at least one though perpetually ineffable yet correct pattern for these traits on this array nevertheless there are in turn 72 attribute traits placed on 50 linear paths and vertex emanations and thus no short supply of possible solutions to this puzzle. This arrangement of these traits I offer here is only one possible out of a great many and should not necessarily be seen as anything above and beyond being arbitrary at best. I present it and the accompanying chart to decoding its labeling here only as a means of convenience in corresponding all attribute traits on these Jacob's Ladder model depictions. Lastly, before we examine the chart for deriving the encryption seen here for each attribute trait, let us pause to consider that the lattice shape of the Jacob's Ladder array provides a total of 51 possible locations for labels, including all native paths and emanations. In this model, we see 
50 of these are used at least once, but that 11 of them are used twice, and there are also added to this sum the pentagram of 5 more and triangle of 6 more, bringing the total of all up to 72 possible placements for attribute traits on the model. Now, as we shall be seeing next in these models, it is possible, however unwieldy, to present not only 72 attribute traits on this shape when the pentagram and triangle are included, but double that sum, 144 traits in total. Now let us look at the chart that determines the code used in the Jacobs Ladder model. Here we can see on the left, above, a tetractus depicting the ten emanations that served as doubled attribute traits on the Tree of Life portion of the Jacob's Ladder. At the top is the One King, below this the Two Queens, below which we find the Three Jacks, and lastly, Four Aces. Beneath each ace is labeled one of the four terrestrial elements, in the order left to right, water, air, fire, earth. Again, the exact order of these elements is malleable and insignificant, and serves here only as a convenient placeholder for the four columns as the four suits in a standard deck of cards. As mentioned previously, we find a list of ten sums on the left, and these label ten rows that cross across the four columns to form a matrix of forty attribute traits. So, on the left, we have the forty plus ten equals fifty attributes, and on the right, we have the list of twenty-two traits, and so, altogether, we have a list of 72 total attribute traits. Instead of each trait being labeled with a number letter or number symbol pair, here each attribute trait is labeled by a pair of number sums, the one to the left followed by a dot, and the one to the right by a parenthesis. These numbers relate to traits I shall be referencing in another lecture in much greater detail, but suffice it to say for here and now that they are coordinate pairs needed to bring the total sum of all attribute traits up from 72 to 144. At this point, it should also be noted that 72 times 2 equals 144, that 72 times 3 equals 216, and that 72 times 5 equals 360. These sums are all integral in the separation of a unit circle into the standard degree system of 360 degree divisions. The list of 22 attribute traits along the right side of this chart is labeled not with a pair of number sums, but with a number sum and a letter. These 22 number letter pairs will comprise the 22 paths or lines on the tree of life. Then the 10 emanations thereof will be doubled to include the labels of the tetractus. In this manner, all 144 individual number sums or letters will be used once although at least two will be used in each area, path or emanation, and most will have four individual number sum labels. So here we see the Jacob's Ladder diagram, modeled with the 144 individual number sums and letters. The pentagram at the base has 10 labels, and the triangle at the top has 12 subtotaling 22 labels. Ten emanations have four labels each, subtotaling 40. Twenty-two paths are labeled each with a letter-number pair, subtotaling 44, 
and the rest of the 38 traits are labeled as 19 pairs of number sums in each remaining area with only one trait repeating as a label on two paths. The purpose of presenting this model in such a complexly encrypted code is to prevent it from being pursued too deeply by idiots who would wish to abuse its potential for confusing the minds of other people to make themselves feel unduly superior. As such, this complex code is absolutely necessary to be able to refer to the material I am about to lay out in an encrypted format. One would absolutely not want to cast pearls before swine by sharing this material openly and in an unencrypted format, because it would lead to an unpleasant and invasive line of questioning from anyone who might happen to see it. For now, at least, let us pause to consider this model of the Jacob's Ladder, loaded up with 144 letters and number sums, as being the ultimate expression of complexity, now known for the usual Tree of Life model of Kabbalah. The Tree of Life is more, after all, than merely its shape, and thus it defies comparison to other models, such as the Flower of Life or other fractal extrapolations, based on shape alone. The Tree of Life is also a set of labels, these corresponding to each part on the overall geometry of the model, and thus it provides a description for a deck's worth of different variables. The standard array of the Jacob's Ladder provides areas for at least 72 and at most around 144 labels. This makes its usefulness in relating large sums of variables to one another into a meaningful relationship transparently clear and apparent.